Good evening, thanks for joining us. We're just getting going, so we're gonna allow some more people to join before we get started with our Missing Middle workshop tonight. Nice to see some generation housing representation here. Hi, Ramon, hi, Cal. Hi, Chair Weeks. It looks like we still have people popping on to join us. So if we want to give it just another minute or two. Sounds great. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We're just going to wait a little bit longer. But thanks for joining our Missy Middle workshop. All right, I think we are probably good to get started when you are ready. Great, well, I will um, just kick it off for the start here. I just wanted to welcome everyone. Thank you for taking some time on this um, beautiful evening outside to join us for our Missing Middle Workshop tonight. We're really excited to be able to present this to you and to be working on this project uh, with the team that we have. And, um, uh, my name is Amy Lyle, and I manage our long-range planning team at the city, Santa Rosa. And I'll go ahead and introduce our project manager and senior planner, Amy Nicholson. She'll be um, leading us through this workshop tonight, and we'll be introducing our presenters for the evening. Thanks, Amy, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to um, share with you what we've learned so far and hear from each of you um, a little bit later in today's workshop. Looks like we're still having a few people joining us, but um, Tony, if you could do a, a quick screen share, and I just want to add, I guess, quickly, um, we do have several other city staff members um, with us this evening. Uh, Michelle, who's um, helping us run this Zoom meeting, and she does an awesome job, so thank you, Michelle. And then we also have um, B Trees and Connor from our planning division. And we have the Opticos team as well. And they're the consultant that is working with us on this project. Um, so maybe Matali and Tony and Cal, if you could just do quick introductions of yourselves, that would be great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Mitali Kangari. I'm, uh, as Amy said, with Opticos Design and uh, very excited to be working on this project. And I'm an urban designer and planner. And um, again, we uh, we really believe in missing middle. So it was very exciting to try and uh, see how best to enable that in Santa Rosa. So excited to present what we have for you and also to get your feedback today. Uh, Tony. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us today. I'm Tony Perez of Opticus Design, and I'm um, assisting Vitaly and Cal on this team. Hi, I'm Cal Kurtz. Um, I'm a designer at Opticos um, and just very excited to uh, present to you all today and get your feedback. Great, thank you. 
Really quick, Amy, would it be okay if we have Beatrice um, confirm if we need translation services for tonight's meeting? Yes, thank you, Michelle. Eh, para las personas que hablan español, si nos pueden eh, ayudar levantando la mano, eh, hay una persona que puede traducir para nosotros, así que debajo de la, de, la, de la barra de Zoom pueden encontrar un mundo que está ahí, pero sí, les pedimos que levanten la mano si, si necesitan eh, traducción y lo, lo podemos proveer. Muchas gracias. I don't think we have... Um, um, Spanish speakers or people who require uh, translation in the room. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. Okay, so just this is a, a slide that shows uh, the agenda for tonight's workshop. Um, so uh, Tony and Matali from Opticos will be uh, making the bulk of today's presentation. Uh, once that presentation concludes, we will move into breakout rooms and we do have a few questions um, that we hope to hear from each of you on. <clears throat> and then we'll conclude the breakout room discussions with a uh, question and answer session um, and uh, wrap up this uh, workshop. So next slide, please. So just some virtual housekeeping. Um, looks like everybody's muted. Um, thanks to those of you who have your video on, it makes us feel a little bit more um, personable and really appreciate all of you joining us tonight. Um, the presentation of this uh, presentation portion will be about 30 to 35 minutes this evening. And then I uh, mentioned the breakout rooms and wrapping up with a question and answer session. Um, at the end, when we go through question, um, the question segment, you're able to either enter your questions in the chat or you can use the raise hand feature. Um, and just a reminder, if we're not able to get to all the questions during our workshop tonight, um, I'll put my email address in the chat and we'll be sure to follow up with you uh, afterwards. And just a reminder that we are recording this workshop. Next slide. Okay. So this is our participation agreement, which um, tends to work really well. We haven't had any issues, but just a reminder to please be respectful of one another's opinions. Um, no hateful, vi violent, or discriminatory language will be tolerated. And again, we will um, follow up with any uh, responses uh, to questions that we are not able to address today. So just as a brief introduction, uh, we have been working on this Missing Middle Housing Initiative for um, many months now. And a lot of this work has really been um, the Opticos team um, digging in and doing a lot of um, data analysis as it relates to the city's current housing needs um, and looking uh, really throughout the city for um, areas where missing middle housing could be successful. Uh, we really see this as an opportunity to increase the number of housing units within parts of the city that are walkable, that already have infrastructure, and that are outside of uh, portions of the city that are more prone to uh, environmental um, issues and also wildfire. We see missing middle housing as a gentle density solution to help the city to meet um, its housing needs. And it really um, helps to provide a variety of housing types that address the um, various uh, members of our community. Um, so again, thank you for participating this evening and I will turn it over to Tony for the next few slides. Sorry, I'm trying to unmute the 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 button there. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm going to present to you the idea, the concept of missing middle housing in three chunks: what it is, where it works best, and the individual types that um, 
that comprise missing middle housing. So what is it? You know, the most basic way to say it, the quickest way to say it is house scale buildings with multiple units in walkable neighborhoods. And we'll talk about all these three aspects of it a little more throughout the presentation, but you know, it, it's very just different from regular multifamily development that we've all been accustomed to over the last 50, 60 years in, the, in these three ways. So if it's two of these, it's, it's good, but it's not missing middle. Uh, if it's all three of these, then it tends to be missing middle. And this type of development, uh, you, you see it in the older areas of cities, especially before the 1940s. That's really when the shift happened uh, away from it. And that, why is it missing? Basically, after 1940, after World War II, there was a big emphasis on producing single family houses um, or apartments in varying sizes and mid rise and, and high rise. And so, for the you know, better part of the last century, most of the choices were either at, at either end of the spectrum and more, more recently townhouses. Um, but people that wanted something in between this that they used to have the option uh, did, don't have it anymore. And so that's where missing middle really comes into play. Uh, and this, this question about how can we get more of it, it really depends on looking at your regulations and your, your comp plan policies, everything that the city is doing um, to, to try and make it uh, easy to, to happen, to put on a level playing field at the same as houses and, and big apartment projects. And so that tends to be, it tends to be necessary to, to shift the way that um, you design, locate, regulate, and develop uh, homes. And you can see the middle of this diagram. That's the missing middle diagram that Dan Perlick, um, um put together uh, almost 12 years ago now, just to really uh, drive home the point that this, this part of the spectrum of all ch housing choices used to occur in neighborhoods and about 1940, it stopped occurring. So digging into those types a little more, this is just to say that, again, you might call this multifamily development because there are multiple units in these buildings, but it's not multifamily development as you know it. It's, it's buildings that are the size of small and large houses in, that fit on the size of lots that are in single family neighborhoods. And they all require a little bit different um, lot width and lot depth, but basically they fit in neighborhoods. That's, that's the biggest, one of the biggest characteristics. And all these numbers below are lot widths and lot depths and the lot area and all that. Just to say that um, you can't paint it with one brush. They're all different types and they have different roles in different parts of the neighborhood. The characteristics of the missing middle types, there's a lot that we could talk about, but these six really stand out. It's always a two-story building with um, occupied space in the attic under the roof, not a third story, but occupied attic space. There are always multiple units, two, and in some cases in the larger buildings, um, the more rare versions of it, up to 19. Uh, the footprint, again, the size of, of a medium, a small to medium or large house. On-street parking um, uh, counts toward the required parking. Uh, again, because of the size of these buildings, they don't have a, a parking lot per se. They have parking on in the side or in the rear. And the driveways are the same size and um, location as driveways for houses. And then again, uh, on-site parking usually is lower because of where these are located, and we'll get into that. The other characteristic to really point out here is that uh, if you have to apply a density term to missing middle, there, it's not low density and it's not high density. We call it medium density. And uh, if you look at the pictures here on the right, one is a, it's a street view of an apartment building on the left and an aerial view of that same apartment building. It has 49 units in it and it mathematically calculates to 30 units per acre. You can see how big that building is, three stories and in the photo above longer than you can see in the photo. On the right is what we're gonna talk about later tonight, a multiplex small has five units in it and the building is much smaller as you can see and it's two stories, that missing middle approach. Uh, and it calculates to 29 to the acre. So mathematically, if you're using density as a, as a lens, these are almost identical. 
but they're not identical in any other way except they're both housing. So it's this idea of lower perceived density and also that they have these numbers that are higher because they, they are on smaller lots and the math just works to have a higher number mathematically, but you can see that it's a much smaller building. These types also, um, some of them have uh, shared spaces. Not all of them do, but some of them do, like the cottage court or the courtyard buildings. And they, they really create a strong sense of community. The, this, this garden is shared by all the units that front it. And you can see their, their entries face it and people see each other. It's, it's very, um, it's, it's semi-private, it's off the street but it's 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 shared and uh, it's a nice way to come to your to your unit your house and also these missing middle types they're again they're very similar in scale and form as single unit houses that's the whole idea and and again you know i would love to say that we came up with this you know whole idea and concept but this is you know nearly 100 years old we are just bringing it back to light that's really what what our advocacy is about. We didn't invent it, but we are uh, bringing it to everyone's attention to, to re-enable again as it used to be. A couple of examples across the country. This one is from Omaha, Omaha Nebraska area. Uh, our office designed this. Um, I think it is a 500 unit or so, maybe 600 units, um, new neighborhood. Uh, for an apartment developer who said, I don't want to do apartments the old apartment way anymore. I want to do it missing middle way. And so this project is entirely duplexes, fourplexes, sevenplexes, tenplexes, townhomes. Uh, there are no houses uh, in this in this project. It's all apartments. And he had a um, he had a um, a criterion. He said, I, I want all the space to be leasable. I don't want any lobbies like in an apartment building. I don't want any corridors that I can't lease and that I have to maintain. I want it all to be units. And so the missing middle approach really spoke to him. And I think the shot that you see here is of one portion of it. And this project is easily half built by now. This is a project closer to us. This is in Healdsburg and it's a cottage court. Uh, you can see there on the left, the site plan and then some photographs. Um, some people call this a, a, a pocket neighborhood. It, it's, if you want to call it either one, uh, they both work. Uh, it's, it's on a site a little under 1.4 acres, uh, 12 uh, cottages around these greens. And um, it's just, it was just finished, uh, River House it's called. So where can missing middle housing work? This is a real, um, real critical aspect of missing middle. This isn't, you know, we always want to make sure that this isn't a new way to build more housing out in the middle of nowhere. And we're not proposing, we're not supposing that you are proposing that. But sometimes people hear uh, how interesting this is and say, oh, this is a great way to build out on that lettuce field. No, this is actually uh, going back to how we found this in older, older communities and older neighborhoods. This tends to occur in areas within short walking distance of amenities. And what are, are those amenities? There are areas that have services, food, shopping, or transit. Ideally, all of those in one place, but you could have one of those and it could be an amenity. Um, alternatively, maybe that you have parks or schools that are within short walking distance. And then when you start looking at your city like that, as Mitali will talk later, it starts to really identify where uh, this makes sense and could work best and, and where it doesn't. So here are three examples I'm going to walk through very um, briefly, uh, just to show you typical conditions, typical situations where we uh, recommend a similar fit. First one is in neighborhoods, existing neighborhoods. Again, if you look at this, these are all detached buildings, they're house scale, and there's a neighborhood corridor on the top and, and a more, um, community-wide corridor on the right here, and then just local streets. And I've just identified a few sites here as examples of where these types could fit. And, and what I'm trying to show here by the different colors of the, of the sites, the way that they're, they have a little identification around them, is that certain of these types work better on busy streets and other types work better on more quiet local streets. It's not a one size fits all. There's a whole palette that you can choose from and how to, how to uh, arrange them. 
And then uh, looking at a neighborhood corridor, you might uh, have a corridor that has housing fronting it. And uh, some of the sites uh, might be uh, in need of redevelopment or the owners might want to be redeveloping them. Uh, say an old gas station site that there's nothing there anymore, Missing Middle could, could work there on that kind of corridor. And so in these areas, the upper end of this palette of missing middle types really works nicely. And then the last uh, example, and you know, we're just showing you three, but there could be 23, but we're just trying to boil it down to some we can talk um, uh, about tonight. The other one I want to talk about is just the transformation of bigger corridors where you see the number one there along that busy uh, road, that busy highway where the, the big shopping centers are that's probably going to need to have more intense development than missing middle and certainly not going to have houses there but you can see that in between that one and that three at the bottom of the screen where that's those are existing neighborhoods that's where you could use missing middle as a transition between more intense buildings that might be let's say office buildings or commercial buildings or maybe just bigger apartments and the houses in between them you could use missing middle as a transition so let's talk about the types here in this third chunk of information. I'm gonna walk through briefly each of these types and just describe them generally. And then uh, you can look at the recording for all the information we have on the screen. You'll see on the right-hand side of the screen, we have the typical characteristics. The lot uh, width is first and then the depth. So 75 feet wide by 150, that's, that's how you can read that, that information there. And then the associated density with it. And again, it's important to know that the density that is calculated for each of these types is based on the lot size that it's on and not the zoning that's there or, or the zoning that um, they're, th they're thinking about. This is just, we measure, measured what is there and put it on the slide. So the first one is duplex side by side. And you can see these two porches, uh, each are individual entries to a unit that is two stories tall and you can see uh, it looks like one house, but you look closer and it, there are two units side by side. This is its cousin, the duplex stacked, which is one unit on top of the other. And you can see the door over on the left, um, by the, you can see the number on, the, on that one column, then the other number to the right, and then the second door. And so there's a stair, stair going up to the, to the upper unit. Um, and the, the, the beauty of the duplex stack is it fits on a narrower lot than its cousin to duplex side by side. And then we're moving up the scale uh, of the, the palette of missing middle types. This is the cottage court. And as its name suggests, it's a, a garden or a courtyard uh, surrounded by one story cottages that are detached. And often there's a two story cottage in the back with two units or three units. In this case, this one has three. And then the, the triplex or the fourplex, again, this is a house. Um, it just happens to have four units in it. And I guess this is a great time to just stop and say that uh, this is not, we, we are not advocating that houses get turned into dorms and, and cut up into every available space turned into a unit. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is talking about an approach that is, again, over 100 years old. And the units were designed from the outset as individual units with kitchenettes or shared kitchen in some cases. Uh, so I just want to make that make that clear. And then we jump up the scale now to a building with five or more units in it. This is a multiplex small or another term you might hear is a mansion apartment. This one is, is one of my favorites and it, it's in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho in the neighborhood near there downtown. And when I first saw it, I thought it was a house. And then I looked closer and I saw it and I went up and looked at it and there were five units in it. Uh, its cousin is the multiplex large. So this has anywhere between 10 and 18 or 19 units in it. But you see that even in this case, it's still a two-story building. Yeah, it has a basement. You can see the window and, and yeah, the, the attic is occupied, but that's the whole point is it's not a three-story apartment building. It's a two-story apartment building and the attic is occupied and still fits in with large houses in this neighborhood. And then the courtyard building, uh, this one has eight units in it. Uh, it's in Santa Barbara. It's, it's a beautiful example of, of just this missing middle scale getting a little bigger now, but it's still, that could be one big house um, or it could be two units. In this case, it's eight. 
And then the last type is this townhouse type. And we find two versions of it. So here's the small, which uh, is the two-story missing middle uh, type. And usually three or four, maybe, maybe five in a row. Uh, this example is four in a row. Um, and its cousin, which is not the missing middle, this is what we would call upper missing middle. It's three stories and a much bigger footprint than what we've been talking about. But I just show it to contrast with, uh, with the rest of them. And then the last one in the, in the palette here is this live work type that uh, combines a couple of units um, on the upper floor um, with, uh, with uh, ground floor workspace. Uh, you see there's a shop in the front and then an, uh, an office, a, an attorney's office and a dentist's office in the back. Um, and this was given to us by the Georgia Conservancy uh, earlier this year. Um, so a fresh type for us. And that is um, where I'll stop and turn it over to my colleague, Amitali. Uh, thanks, Tony. And I'll uh, just a second as I kind of pivot to sharing my screen. All right, so just confirming that you all can kind of see uh, uh, my uh, screen move. Yeah, just one sec. Uh, can you see the slide advance? Sorry, I just need to ask that because it's kind of spinning at my end. No, it's not advancing. It's not advancing, right? So I'm just going to, sorry, uh, stop sharing and then share again. One sec, please. Apologies for that. All right, so uh, can you kind of uh, see, uh, let me go back a level. Can you kind of see the enabling missing middle in Santa Rosa slide? All right, thank yes, you. Yes, we can see that. Sorry, more Zoom issues. You would think that, you know, three years down the line, all this would be in the past, but clearly not. So, yeah, so thank you. So um, just building upon what Tony discussed, um, I'm going to just kind of translate some of that into what our work has been specific to Santa Rosa. So uh, our work for this included kind of three uh, clear-cut portions of work, if, if that's how you want to break up our scope. So key to that was, first of all, understanding what is actually existing in Santa Rosa. And most of this was in the form of uh, analysis. And this was done at a citywide scale. And this included studying what is currently there, you know, like what existing examples are there of missing middle in Santa Rosa, of analyzing the existing and allowed land use patterns, lot sizes, lot configurations, and such. Also understanding what are existing community destinations, what are current centers, what are potential future centers, because that, as Tony described, is a key to creating and enabling missing middle and making it successful of having areas where people um, uh, find, uh, you know, and uh, have a, a natural tendency to walk just because there are enough amenities within uh, uh, an easy and an enjoyable walking distance. And um, at the same time, we also analyzed existing regulations to identify what are barriers to actually allowing missing middle in Santa Rosa. So this piece was kind of our um, analysis to do with kind of the physical and existing and regulatory conditions. Then in parallel to that, we also carried out the financial feasibility of certain types. So for this, what this uh, meant was to select repeating patterns, like what are the most typical lot sizes that we see in Santa Rosa, what are appropriate missing middle types that might work there, and uh, then carrying out like a performa analysis to see what can or cannot pencil out under current market conditions. So the result of these two is to give us a good sense of what is appropriate uh, for both for Santa Rosa's context, its existing physical conditions, and also what is likely to kind of pencil out and be financially viable. And that would feed into uh, you know, our actual work, which is the end product of this entire project, which is a, a missing middle overlay zone in the form of an actual map and accompanying standards that would uh, help in actually implementing missing middle standards. So um, this is basically an overview of our work. The last piece that I just mentioned, which is the overlay zone work, is something that is in progress. The analysis piece and the financial feasibility piece have been concluded. So I'm just going to talk you through uh, what have been our key findings to do with some of these tasks. So to begin with, um, 
as Tony pointed out, in most places we find that it's not like a new concept that we're introducing. You know, look hard, and in most uh, areas, you know, we can find examples of missing middle. So what you see on the screen are examples from Santa Rosa. These were all uh, generously um, contributed to us by city staff because uh, most of this project was done uh, during active COVID. And so we were not able to physically visit each and every street. So um, the city staff was very helpful in actually going out and documenting a lot of these examples. So as you can see, there is um, there, there are enough examples existing in Santa Rosa of duplexes, of multiplexes, fourplexes, and even a cottage court. So some of the types that Tony just had described. And these are examples from Santa Rosa neighborhoods themselves. Also, uh, in terms of our mapping analysis, as I mentioned, this was done at a citywide scale to uh, understand what uh, the current context is, what things are likely to change, and just to understand uh, which areas are most suitable towards um, us focusing on for enabling missing middle. So uh, in terms of land use, you know, why do we study this? Because as Tony described, there are certain underlying conditions that need to be met for missing middle to be recommended and for missing middle to actually be successful. So typically we find that low density residential neighborhoods, they do not offer the right context. And why is this? Because um, among other factors, a key factor is parking. You know, for areas which are highly dependent on parking and which need uh, to be dependent on driving for most daily activities, you know, uh, just adding on more units uh, without kind of being able to find more space for parking just doesn't pan out. So typically these areas are not ideal for missing middle. There are exceptions in certain cases. Similarly, on the, on the other end of the scale, there are higher density environments, such as those directly adjacent to transit stations, transit nodes, and along busy corridors, where also missing middle may not work in most uh, cases. And the reason for that is that these areas are better suited for higher density and higher intensity environments, such as larger buildings, essentially, like kind of more intense mixed use buildings. So even in these contexts, missing middle um, will not work ideally. So what are we looking for? We're looking for medium density residential zones, mixed use zones, but within walkable areas. So these are the areas that we honed in on, on our study of the land use, um, of the existing land use map in Santa Rosa. At the same time, we were also looking at what the underlying zoning is. So again, carrying through with what we just discussed, the lowest intensity residential zones, such as the RR and the R1 zones are unlikely to support missing middle types. So again, we are focusing on the medium intensity residential zones, and these in Santa Rosa are the Transit Village, the TV, the R2, and the R3 zones, as well as the several mixed use zones that are there, and these have a lot of potential for missing middle housing. Now, a note on uh, plan developments, you know, or PDs. Typically in our missing middle analysis and work, we would tend to avoid these areas simply because these are kind of, you know, examples of negotiated standards and, and uh, you know, like very complicated regulatory uh, conditions. And that makes it very challenging to uh, roll them into like an overall um, like set of zoning standards for missing middle. But in the case of Santa Rosa, some PDs may need to be considered. And the reason for this is that a, a very large part of the city is actually under PDs. So for that reason alone, we are considering PDs in some of the, uh, the areas that we're recommending for missing middle. So in also assessing where the city wants to intensify and where potential growth areas may happen, we looked at both areas that have uh, like good existing infrastructure, good access, where we think uh, further intensification is possible. And at the same time, also areas that we should frankly stay away from. So there are certain areas which are environmentally constrained, in particular those which are within the, the VUI, you know, the, the wildland urban interchange, the interface. So these are areas where ideally we would not want to see further intensification. We don't want to add on housing in these areas. So these are, again, zones that we would uh, shy away from when considering, you know, where missing metal housing may apply. A thing to note is that uh, already the city has kind of set some priority growth areas, as you can see with the blue boundary. These are kind of the, the priority development area or the PDA, which spans existing uh, primary corridors and also along the transit station areas. So these would definitely be the, the parts of the city where we think missing middle would be successful. So um, I had also mentioned in the beginning that apart from looking at where um, the current land use uh, situation is, like what is currently allowed, what may change, how the city may grow, we also have to look at the physical, um, the, the existing physical pattern of lots, like what are 
predominant lot widths and lot depths and lot configurations. And the reason for this is that uh, the minimum lot sizes are intrinsically kind of tied in to the palette of missing middle types. So not every type is going to work on every lot. So we want to be very mindful that when we are thinking about, you know, recommending missing middle types, these are uh, kind of cross-referenced in a way with what are existing lot conditions. So we carried out an analysis and uh, tried to group uh, existing lots, uh, lot sizes and lot patterns within the city into these uh, different categories based on lot widths. So the reason for using lot widths in particular is that that's often a more critical criteria when we are trying to decide which missing middle type, building type, would work on which lot as compared to the lot depth. So both are important, but lot width is typically a more uh, important criteria to consider. So on the basis of uh, this study and uh, the other preceding studies, it'll help us in, in kind of taking the entire palette of missing middle types and actually figuring out which ones would be appropriate and which ones would fit physically and otherwise on uh, existing uh, Santa Rosa lots. We also uh, talked a lot about the importance of access to amenities, of trying to be within a walkable environment and also within uh, like easy proximity to either existing or potential mixed use centers. So uh, with that in mind, we uh, analyzed existing community destinations. As you can see on the key, these uh, span a wide variety of destination types. The, these include employment hubs, they include uh, popular open spaces, they include downtown, which in itself is like a destination, and uh, a variety of other areas. So this, in other words, gives us a sense of where the community is currently walking to or uh, gravitating towards, and um, also within the neighborhood scale, where are the educational institutions, the parks, and other such areas that can become you know, future community hubs, or those could be kind of future walkable centers. So we found, and this is fairly typical um, in most uh, communities, that there are three key types of uh, walkable centers within Santa Rosa. We do have downtown, obviously, which is a citywide destination, and it's got everything. It's got retail, dining options, services, entertainment, recreation, and um, as well as significant housing and office uses. In addition to that, we found neighborhood main streets. So these are, again, neighborhood level destinations for much of the same things like retail, food users and services. And we find that these are amongst the most typical types of centers that can encourage missing middle within neighborhoods or adjacent to neighborhoods. And also um, at another sense of scale, we have like smaller neighborhood nodes, which are kind of commercial or mixed use nodes that are at important uh, street intersections or cross sections that can, again, serve the same function of providing services and amenities to the surrounding neighborhoods. So with all these kind of parallel uh, pieces of analysis in mind, it's almost like we had to overlay all this information to try and ascertain what are the potential areas for missing middle housing. So there were actually two sets of maps, one with and without the plan developments. Here we are showing you the map that does include the PDs because as I mentioned earlier, at times we don't include these, but uh, in Santa Rosa's case, we feel it does make sense to consider PDs simply because there's so many of them. So as you can see on this map, we looked at including existing R1, R2, R3, as well as mixed use zones. And this includes not just the existing walkable centers, but also the potential walkable centers and also neighborhoods, which may not be perfect for missing middle right now, but we are thinking of the future. So within the next five, 10, 15 years, these have all the potential to develop with that gentle intensification that we've been talking about of, um, in, of being able to support missing middle. So we call these neighborhoods missing middle ready, you know, which is like, let's just say not, not the most technically um, savvy term, but I think you get the meaning that, you know, we're looking at the future and trying to include areas which have that uh, ready potential. So the blue outline in a nutshell basically highlights the areas where we think missing middle would work best within Santa Rosa. And this is on the basis of all the preceding analysis that I just uh, walked you through. At the same time, we also looked at the regulatory um, situation essentially in Santa Rosa. We looked at the existing regulations within each of these zones that we were considering. And you can see in this matrix, uh, the critical uh, factors that we consider that in our experience, we found to be key determinants as to whether missing middle is currently uh, enabled or not is listed on the left. 
So these are almost like questions that we ask when we look at the existing zone standards. And as you can see, it's like a red light, green light situation. Uh, for most of the zones, as you can see, um, you know, the conditions are fine for enabling missing middle, for allowing missing middle. And uh, there are certain things that we do need to work with, and those are highlighted with red circles. You'll notice that for the planned development column, everything is a question mark, and there are a few of those in other places as well. This uh, basically indicates that the existing regulations are such that it's not uh, very simple to answer this question. So, you know, it's, it, we just kind of need to approach it from a slightly different view. And in the case of PDs, since the rules and regulations for each individual PD uh, vary, so it's not uh, possible for us to kind of analyze this at that scale, you know, for every individual plan development. But uh, again, this is something that we feel is important to include in our analysis, so that's why we are including PDs as of now. Uh, and another critical piece, because, you know, we didn't want to be thinking about, um, you know, simply the spatial needs of different missing middle types and of the existing context. We also wanted to be realistic about what the current housing market is telling us. So we've teamed up with um, uh, Strategic Economics, they were the team economist, and we carried out an actual financial feasibility analysis for some of the key building types that we felt would work uh, for Santa Rosa. So as you can see uh, from this matrix, we tested five missing middle uh, uh, prototypes and uh, for all of them, we kept the site area the same. In other words, we considered a 6,000 square foot lot and we assumed the same parking, which was a one parking space per unit. And um, we ran the numbers essentially like doing from a developer side performa analysis using the residual, residual land use value method, which is like the most kind of common methodology for trying to assess if there is enough potential in a site for a developer to purchase that lot, to redevelop it, and then to either uh, have it out for rent or to sell it. So this is a very typical um, model for trying to assess whether a particular project is going to be financially feasible or not. So under current market conditions, unfortunately, none of the prototypes were completely feasible. Some were closer to feasibility than others, but, um, I, and we want to be transparent about this, but this does, um, this doesn't kind of mean that missing middle can never work in Santa Rosa. In fact, far from it. This just reflects current market conditions, but we are looking to enable this for the next 10, 15, 20 years. So um, with that in mind, we can proceed with our work in terms of the next steps for the project. So in the beginning, we talked a little bit about what the final outcome of this entire project is going to be, you know, the study that we are undertaking. And that is to come up with a missing middle housing overlay zone that can be applied on the city, on, on top of the city's zoning map. And within this, there would be a specific missing middle zones with standards that are uh, that just enable uh, or are a streamlined way of enabling missing middle within those zones. So um, as you can see, this is a draft regulating plan and this and the other standards that I'll just be talking about are part of the administrative draft of the set of zoning standards that is being reviewed by the city right now. Based on their feedback and also based on the feedback that we'll receive today, some of that information will get updated and changed and modified. And uh, this would go towards the, the public review draft that would be out this summer for the community to give us feedback on. So essentially, uh, as you can see again, the, you, you'll remember from a few slides back, we looked at the potential areas for missing middle in Santa Rosa. So what you're seeing here within the colored uh, polygons essentially is that same uh, boundary. This is where we are looking at essentially two uh, zones, and these are kind of two flavors of missing middle in a way, and we're keeping this terminology fairly simple for right now, is the neighborhood small and the neighborhood medium, and there is like a variation, um, as you see, called the open zone. So the open subzone is pretty much similar in look and feel, like in terms of built form and other physical characteristics to the base zone, but uh, they at times allow additional uh, additional uses or additional uh, building frontage requirements and things like that, just to um, you know give a bit more flexibility to uh, to what is allowed in that particular zone. So diving a little bit uh, deeper into what these two missing middle zones are, just giving a very high level um, summary of these. They're not very different. Both include house scale buildings. It's just that the range of buildings is slightly different uh, between one and the other. The neighborhood small uh, is uh, talking about slightly smaller building footprints, slightly larger setbacks, 
and um, like uh, one story lesser than uh, what is allowed in the neighborhood medium zone. So the two are very similar. And in terms of the building types that are included, the palette for neighborhood small includes the, the house, the single family house, a duplex, a cottage court, a fourplex, a multiplex, and a townhouse. Whereas the neighborhood medium includes a fourplex, a multiplex, a townhouse, and a courtyard building. So just slightly differing shades of intensity, but ultimately both will include house scale buildings. And in look and um, feel, you know, in form and in height, they would be very compatible with existing single family um, residential, you know, neighborhoods. They would fit right in and may not even be visible in many cases. So um, I also just wanted to touch very briefly about um, further steps, like apart from this, um, the public review draft that I just mentioned that we're working on, we are also engaging with the city to carry out um, trainings, you know, with city staff uh, specific to form-based codes and to missing middle housing and basically how to kind of go about implementing this and how to make the code most efficient for Santa Rosa. So what you see on the screen here are some of the key topics that we'll be discussing with city staff as we continue to refine the public review draft that I mentioned. And in terms of upcoming tasks, um, uh, apart from what I just mentioned, the, which are the missing middle housing code, like the public review draft of that, and the training sessions, we'll also be having further outreach in the form of like a training workshop or several training sessions that will include local developers and architects from within Santa Rosa. So these are again meant to be um, like sessions in which um, we kind of explain what we have done. We have actual uh, hands-on working sessions. And in the process, we also learn uh, and improve upon, you know, the, the actual code and the standards based on uh, the feedback that we get from, you know, local developers and from the community. In addition to that, we'll obviously also be having public <coughs> hearings and meetings, and those will also be opportunities to uh, hear from all of you. So um, that's what I had in terms of the presentation, and uh, uh, Amy, if you just want to kind of uh, walk us through to the next steps. Thank you so much, Matali and Tony, for that great presentation. Um, so I think now we're ready to go into some breakout rooms and um, discuss a few questions that we have prepared. And just um, we hope to hear your thoughts generally on, on what you heard during today's presentation um, and just yeah, any other ideas that you have. So I think Michelle can press a button and, and put us all into rooms and look forward to, to speaking with you. Okay, rooms are opening now. Rue, if you would like to go ahead and join your breakout room, they'll have some questions um, and conversation for you to partake in. I have a horrible allergy cold thing. I'm not talking. I'll listen. Okay, yeah, I would still hop in and at least, yeah, hear what other people are saying. Okay. Okay.
Can you send me back to my breakout room real quick? Sorry. I can't because they're closed. I was putting something in the chat and I pressed enter and I, I think it was at the same time that the option was to join the room. Oh no. That's fine. Um, so I think my group is rejoining, but um, I just wanted to respond to you because uh, uh, we were having a conversation and I was just giving a plug about our general plan update. So I'll put that in the chat here as well. And then there was a question about the Southeast Greenway and that project is still moving forward. So that plan was adopted and um, that project, we are working with Caltrans to acquire the property. So that is still moving forward. It's just on a very slow uh, pace because we do have to work with Caltrans who is the current owner of that property. But I am gonna put our general plan information in the chat. Um, so as you're thinking about missing middle, please also consider joining our conversations related to the general plan, which include uh, a lot more than just missing middle housing, but um, looking at a very broad brush of the city and housing circulation and, and all things included in that. Thanks everyone. I'm assuming most everyone's back now. Everyone's back. Okay, great. What I'm going to do is share, and some of you may have looked at these in your breakout rooms, but a link to um, a concept board, if, if that's okay, Matali. And then um, this, you can click guest if you click on this link. Um, and it'll allow you to zoom in a bit more on some of the maps that we have, just if you um, wanna, wanna dive in a bit more. So just put that in the chat for you if you're curious. Um, I hope that everyone had some interesting discussions. I know that, that our, our room did. And perhaps now we can wrap up with just some um, questions. And so feel free to type them in the chat or raise your hand and hopefully we can go through a few of them. or general comments. I, I have a question. Um, is there any planners currently in the city of Santa Rosa that are able to push something like this forward? So we, we are um, continuing with this effort over the, um, the next year or so. Um, and so that our next steps really are to go to many of the city's um, planning boards. So um, the design review board, the cultural heritage board, the planning commission to review a lot of the materials that we talked about this evening and to um, hear from them. And then um, kind of the final step in the process would be bringing an ordinance forward to adopt these regulations uh, to the planning commission and then finally the city council. So we hope to be um, finishing up with that effort over the next eight or 10 months, I would say. Well, I, I would suggest what you really need to do is uh, uh, enroll a planner that's willing to stick their neck out for some of these laws that are already in place. because it's the planners that are actually gonna be pushing it through the city. And without uh, planner support, none of these projects are going to uh, go anywhere. I, I appreciate that comment. And I will say that um, we have a, a fantastic team of planners on the call today. And this project is really just starting to get going. And this is our first public workshop on this particular um, concept. And we've been really blessed because we've been able to hire Opticos, which they are the experts in this field um, related to missing metal. And we've seen their work take hold in other jurisdictions. And we are very excited about it. Um, that being said, we are not the decision makers and we do our best to put forward uh, recommendations to the decision makers that uh, based on community input, we feel uh, works for the time and the place and the situation. And, but it is ultimately up to those decision makers. So it would be great if you're able to attend those uh, 
those meetings coming up. We do have a couple scheduled in the next few months and voice your, your support or your uh, comments on all things and uh, continue to be aware of uh, and, and just in the process as it moves forward. Is there any other questions from the group? I don't comments? have a question. I, I just want to make a general comment that I think this is fabulous. I'm really happy to see it moving forward. Um, I, I, you know, the other Amy and I have spoken and in the breakout room, you know, I made a number of comments that I'm sure Amy made notes about and I'll bring them forward in the future. But I really am very happy to see this. I think the uh, the team of the city and Opticos have done a really good job. Um, so I just want to say thanks because I'm sure I'll be much more crabby as it moves forward about some things. But generally speaking, I'm really glad to see where you are now. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Sonia, for your support and your comments. We appreciate crabbiness and non-crabbiness. We like all the comments because we want to make sure this really represents what the community wants and needs. Really quick, Amy, we have a couple comments um, in the chat. Um, Crystal says, um, I would appreciate home ownership being a strong, if not leading component of housing development within the missing middle housing framework. Um, both Caroline and Mary agree with that sentiment. Thank you so much, Michelle. And Cal's a plus one on that one as well. Yeah, and if I may, I'm, I'm curious, because I brought this up in our conversation, you know, uh, to my knowledge, the only prefab developer in the Bay Area that I, I'm intimately familiar with is Factory OS, and they're not quite at the, the scale where they can functionally do these smaller projects, they can only really pencil out larger projects with their current funding streams. Um, and I noted um, here in your feasibility findings that there's, you know, uh, they essentially suggested or indicated that it would be five to 10 years where we, before we could see this essentially penciling out. Um, now, is that assuming that we're gonna enter into some sort of like agreement with someone like Factor LS? Are we gonna try and lure someone to Sonoma County that can develop it here? Cause obviously that would reduce the cost dramatically. Has there been any discussions around that? see if anyone from the Opticos team wants to respond to that related to the, uh, the economic piece and the timeline on when we may be ready for this type of housing uh, as far as the, the, in, the construction industry. Yeah, so, um, you know, as we discussed, the feasibility analysis looks at a certain point of time, right? So that is based on the current market. So now, I mean, ideally what would need to change is that construction costs would need to normalize slightly, land costs would need to go down slightly, neither of which um, seem to be happening in the Bay Area. But at the same time, if we have, uh, because everyone agrees that it's abnormal, and but uh, at the same time, it doesn't go down. So we don't quite know, um, you know how that might uh, play out. And um, another thing that a lot of people, and uh, Tony, please feel free to chime in on this, is um, that, uh, that we are all kind of watching closely is, the role of kind of prefabrication in a lot of missing middle housing. So, or kind of modular construction in uh, missing middle housing. So not for each and every type, but that will also lead to efficiencies in just construction techniques, you know, that, that are employed. So that is definitely an industry that's really picking up. Um, not so much so in the Bay Area yet, but in, in many other jurisdictions, we're seeing that. And also, um, let's just say in kind of enabling a more uh, developer friendly environment, so to speak, uh, in terms of missing middle, a lot of the steps that the city is taking right now, you know, whether it's just kind of enshrining missing middle as part of the zoning code of just kind of streamlining the production of missing middle, of kind of just making it a very um, like open and obvious process. All these things also lead to developer certainty, right? Like, as we know, no one wants to be the first person to take a risk, but as the underlying conditions improve, I think it'll also attract 
um, you know, the developer community from also taking the plunge. And we're seeing this happening in other parts of California, just not so much in the Bay Area, just because, uh, you know, it's a it's a very uh, expensive place to build in. Um, Tony, if you want to kind of share anything else on that, please. Well, I'll say, as, as um, Tony's thinking that, I, I really appreciated the, the economic study behind um, what you'll see on the website there, because a lot of times uh, we'll just hear, it won't pencil, the industry's not ready. Um, but strategic economics really provided some really different concepts that uh, we as government really have not employed. So looking at the po potential for gap financing, even for um, single family owner or, you know, uh, someone who wants to do one type of missing metal project, not a developer, but also looking at the actual workforce and um, diving into helping the industry and providing more workforce to the construction industry. And in the economic report, they did say, as Natalie noted, that we have, um, we, at least we score pretty well as far as streamlining housing and providing fee reductions. But um, we are, in all ways related to housing, have been trying over the years to remove as many hurdles as possible, um, but still um, creating housing that, that fits the neighborhood compatibility that we want uh, for our community. So it's, it's been hard to decipher what more can we do to be able to, to facilitate more housing. So I thought this economic report was really one of the only times where they provided some really interesting different options that are not usually within our toolbox that we are gonna be looking into. Amy, quick follow-up question for you, but, um, cause this goes back to my, kind of one of the previous things I, I, I noted. I'm just curious what we can do as a collective community, not just Santa Rosa, but a, as a county to essentially lure some sort of company here or some sort of, um, so yeah, some sort of uh, a company that's willing to develop on site here locally, um, produce these prefab um, materials, uh, because I think there's a lot of opportunities for a commercial like project of that scale to, to be placed in the airport area. Um, I mean, there's a variety of places that we could we could easily um, have an operation like that um, functionally, um, you know, work out. Um, because that would reduce, you know, the cost related to travel. Um, it would reduce, you know, having to source materials potentially from, you know, farther distances. There, there's just a variety of benefits. And I'm wondering if we could, if there's like an exclusive development agreement or something we could do that would incentivize someone to, to want to come here, to want to set up shop. Not to mention all the jobs. Like we talk about bringing these large companies here to help, you know, spruce up, you know, our job market, to help support, you know, working families, to help our, you know, our housing, right? Well, I can't think of anyone better in terms of like trying to bring, you know, a large developer than, than someone that's actually going to develop. Um, so I don't know if that's something you guys have really discussed at any length or not, but um, it'd be interesting to see if we could lure someone here. Absolutely. I think those are great comments, Cal. And I think that, that could be another um, topic for a workshop to see if there's um, connections or, or things that we can ask of the community to help us as we work with developers or try to um, increase a workforce here locally. But that does tie and dovetail with our economic development goals of not just the city, but other jurisdictions as well. And uh, that does remind me, I just wanted to give a plug that all of our jurisdictions in Sonoma County, all the cities in the county, are all working on a housing element at the same time. So there's gonna be lots of opportunity for you all to review those programs and to um, comment on those as they move through the process through the rest of this year. So stay tuned to, um, we will be releasing our housing element, um, which is somewhat separate from this missing middle project, but that'll be coming out in the next month, in the next few weeks actually. And so programs, uh, we are looking for innovative programs and things that we can create to help facilitate housing in the next um, few years. Ramon? Yes, I just wanted, before we all go, I want to shameless plug our um, webinar on Thursday, uh, Generational Housing. If you can uh, join, we have a webinar on environmental and housing justice. So if that's something interesting, please join us. It's going to be 5.30 to 6.00. 
six, was it Tom Callum? I think uh, six forty-five. So come and join us. And we have, um, yeah, it, that's it. Thank you. I think our very own Beatrice will be on that panel. Yes. Yes. Um, so I know that we're at time, but there are some questions and comments that I would like to read through really quick in, in the chat box. Um, so the first question is, is there any way to involve local smaller contractors and subs in these projects? Absolutely. Please help us get the word out. Um, please connect us if you can. And um, as Matali noted in the presentation, we are... Um, educating ourselves on these new concepts, but are hoping to educate our development community as well to make sure that we're creating tools that um, they're, they're ready for, um, that we understand the new tools that we're creating, form-based code. And uh, a lot of this is rather new to our, our staff here at the city and then to the development community. So we really want to connect as many people and bring people into this process um, as possible. And then a comment from Catherine. Um, keep in mind allowing lot division to allow for fee simple ownership, say in townhouses, but also in side by side multi units. Um, also, co op options. Don't prevent with unnecessary restrictions. Also, don't limit where it can be located so that as opportunities present themselves, these types can move forward. As long as parking is provided, you don't have to be in a strictly walkable situation. Let opportunity happen, please. And then we have um, one, two, three, four, five agrees with that comment. Um, and Rue says this type of change is going to require flexibility to launch successfully. Um, and then we have a few more agrees with both of those comments. Um, we have allow in R and R1 as well, although essential to be um, form-based codes, cute and neighborhood friendly. Um, and then um, here's a suggestion, Idea Box out of Oregon has great prefab designs. Um, and BAMCOR in Windsor produces panels made from bamboo. Um, and I'll save the chat just um, for the participants, just know that I'm saving the chat. So your comments and suggestions, we will, we will have a record of these. Um, and then um, Sonia would like to know if we can provide a copy of the presentation. Yeah, so um, I'll go ahead and post a copy of the presentation on the project webpage. So that's srcity.org slash missing middle housing. So we'll work on doing that tomorrow. Okay, and then it looks like we have a few other great um, suggestions that we can look at, including Empire Chapter of AIA for a lunch and learn would get the word out. Um, and then could be, um, at, could, MM could be part of plan development to begin broadening the types. And um, like I said, I'll be saving the chat so that we'll have all of your comments and suggestions um, to reference. Thank you so much. These are great suggestions. And we would love to do a lunch and learn with AIA. So I'll we'll try to reach out to, to that group as well. Catherine, if you're involved, stay tuned. And so Michelle, you said we are at time. I can't remember when we were supposed to end. <laughs> um, we were scheduled to end at seven, I believe. So oh my we're, a little we're a little past time, but we got aw awesome comments, so. Too much fun. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and close out. Um, thank you all so very much for joining us tonight. And thank you to the Opticos team. And thank you to our city staff who stayed late tonight to help us um, with the breakout rooms and just um, Michelle, who is our Zoom guru always. Um, really appreciate all your time. Please stay tuned to the website. And um, if you registered for this, um, we will continue to keep you up to date on this process. And so the next steps will be um, a similar presentation to uh, a couple of our boards and commissions, Design Review Board, Cultural Heritage Board. So that will be an opportunity to vocalize your, um, your comments, concerns, support, and, um, and then continue to follow us through the process. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
拜。